Hello everybody. Welcome back to Whiskey with the Werewolf Hunter. I'm Brian Easton, author of the Autobiography of a Werewolf Hunter series, and this is the whiskey that we're having tonight. Now this is a, a George Dickel White Whiskey Corn uh, Corn Mash, White Corn Whiskey. Now, the, not my favorite. I got to tell you, uh, Corn Whiskey differs from bourbon and other other whiskeys uh, in a fundamental way. You have to be 80% corn. Uh, you have to have 80% corn in your mast uh, in order to be called corn corn whiskey. Bourbon uh, uses 51%, I believe, as its as its base, and then they mix rye and uh, barley uh, in with the mast, and then they age that bourbon in in casks. That are charred on the inside, which is where the whiskey gets its brown color from. See, they take these old casks and they scorch the inside of them with the torches and makes it brown on the inside. And then they they put the, all the whiskey goes in white like this. And then over the course of its aging process, it takes on the color and some of the oak flavors and the char flavors from that barrel. Corn whiskey uh, can only use second. Uh, second generation or previously used charred barrels or it's aged in, in non-charred barrels. Uh, it's, it's strange all the laws you get into when you're dealing with whiskey and, uh, and the government. But anyway, that's what it is in case you cared. So we talk because we talk about the werewolves, we might as well talk a little bit about the whiskey too. And like I said, this is uh, George Dickel corn whiskey, which is not my, uh, not my favorite, but I thought I'd give it a, give it a shot anyway. So couple of weeks now we've done things a little differently than what we used to. Uh, two weeks ago uh, I had a special segment outside where I addressed the question of one of uh, one of my friends uh, Sarah and we talked about the full moon and silver bullets and and things like that and then last week I didn't really have time to do a full whiskey with the werewolf hunter episode so we just kind of did a brief kind of, hey, how you doing, getting to know you live video over YouTube, which was a first for me. So we're going to get back to our regularly scheduled program this week, and we're going to get into the Code of the Monster Hunter later on down in the episode. So sit back and enjoy it, and here it comes. So I had a chance to watch the new John Wick movie this weekend, uh, being a big fan of the first two installments. In that franchise and I have to tell you uh, John Wick 3 Parabellum does not disappoint it's right up there with the other two and in my opinion uh, Ken Reeves has really totally reinvented himself with this franchise uh, nothing against the the, the 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 guy as an actor uh, but to me you know he was always that wacky guy from Bill and Ted's excellent adventure uh, but he he has managed to shatter that old typecast uh, even though I understand he's planning some sort of a reunion project with the co-star of that film. So anyway, new respect for, for uh, Cano Reeves uh, after the John Wick thing. So I, I tell you that just because, uh, like I said, I had a chance to see it and loved it. Uh, but uh, you've heard me talk about Miles Booth, who is the publisher of MB Press, who put out the large, uh, or put out most of the Legends of the Monster Hunter uh, series that you've heard me talk about uh, time and time again and he sent me a message the other day uh, having watched the first John Wick for the first time a few years late but he's finally getting around to it and was was uh, uh, really blown away by it like a lot of us were uh, but he like he said he sent me a message and he said that he was struck by the similarities between the character of John Wick and and SLJ Sylvester Logan James and he thought that it might be a good idea to bill uh, Sylvester as the John Wick of werewolf hunters, and uh, thought that that might be a good uh, good idea promotionally speaking. Uh, and I had no problem with that. I, you know, he could be the John Wick of werewolf hunters. Uh, you know, it's a good idea to me. Uh, but aside from that, I confess that I, I, and I told him so that I that, that I didn't really see or I hadn't really noticed any great similarities between John Wick and um, and Sylvester, aside from just the sheer badassery that both characters bring to the table. 
I mean, you know, John Wick's an urban assassin. He's the creme de la creme of international hitmen. Uh, you know, he's got uh, expensive tastes in weapons, in suits and cars. And, uh, you know, as much as I appreciated the comparison, I just, I just didn't really get it. I didn't think that they have that much in common. And, uh, and, I, and I told, like I said, I told him that. And he responded by saying that uh, in, in, in the original film, at least, which is the only one that he had seen at that point, uh, watching John Wick 1 really got him thinking about how both characters, uh, John Wick and Sylvester, live outside the world that we consider normal and indeed live in their own reality. I mean, in Wick's world, there are elements like the high table and the Continental Hotel, uh, the blood markers and the, the, you know, the coins that are used for transactions, uh, things like this, uh, that really kind of dictate the parameters of John Wick's life and his work. And with SLJ, uh, that you know, he has the lineage politics to contend with, and they pretty much define, define uh, his life. Uh, and so he, Miles went on to say that both of them were completely uh, sold out with a single-minded purpose as emissaries of death to their, uh, their chosen targets, that they were both highly disciplined and trained to achieve their various goals despite physical pain, despite mental distractions and frequent setbacks. Uh, you know, he, he also said, you know, that it was... You know, it was worth mentioning that both characters have nicknames given to them by their enemies. Baba Yaga for John Wick, and of course the lineage refers to Sylvester as the woodsman. Both characters are motivated by loss, uh, loss of loved ones, and driven by, in large part, I think, by guilt. I know that's definitely true with Sylvester, and I, I picked that up with, uh, with John Wick. Uh, as well, especially after this this third installment that I saw over the weekend, so they're motivated by uh, loss and guilt, and fueled by their quest initially by the loss of a dog. Now that was interesting. I I didn't see that one coming at all, uh, because the, the very first book, Sylvester loses uh, a do a dog named Brutus, which he actually, you know, shoots and kills unintentionally. And that kind of sets things into motion for him as far as uh, learning to, to hate things, which becomes the seed that grows and takes over the man uh, as, as he progresses as a character. And, of course, John Wick uh, loses the, the puppy, which is about more than the puppy, uh, but it's the, same, it's the same kind of dynamic going, going to work there. Uh, so, anyway, Miles said, take away their backdrops, uh, and just kind of strip the characters down to the things that, that they are and then what motivates them, and they struck, uh, struck him as very similar. And so I can't argue with any of that. And I suppose I'm too close to my own character to, to really notice those similarities uh, at first. And naturally, I don't mind the comparison at all, except I might add that since Sylvester predates Wick by about 10 years or so, according to my calculations, uh, I like to think that John Wick has a lot in common with Sylvester Logan James instead of the other way around. So taking another look at the 10 fears, which as you may remember was an article that I wrote several years ago for Horrorwood.com, which I took uh, 10 classic movie monsters, the 10 classic movie monsters to my way of thinking, and kind of match them up with some of the most basic fears of the human race. And uh, tonight, we're just, I'm just going to go over a couple um, that are, are a lot of times overlooked, I think. And some of them, some people don't even consider uh, one or, or, or both of these characters as true monsters in the Universal canon. Uh, I do, and I think that they rightfully deserve that title. Uh, but when we're talking about horror, uh, like Stephen King had said during in his, in his Dance Macabre, and I mentioned this in one of the first episodes that we did, uh, he tries to terrify his readers. If he can't terrify, he'll horrify. If he can't horrify, he'll go for the gross out. So the three stages of the horror genre that he breaks down are terror, that creeping dread, 
horror, the moment the creature is in your face, and three, revulsion, which is the gut pile and, you know, rip someone's throat being ripped out or what have you. Revulsion. And there's an attraction to all three of those things. Otherwise, we wouldn't watch these kind of movies. Um, but I don't think you can do better than to uh, talk about revulsion. I don't think you could find any better examples of that uh, in, the, in the classic movie, monster movie world, than to talk about Quasimodo and the Phantom of the Opera. Now, aside from both being ugly Frenchmen and uh, haunting large Parisian landmarks, uh, these guys are both, uh, like I said, they're, they're kind of overlooked. They were both uh, silent films, the first film, first Universal monster films that ever done, both done by by the great Lon Chaney, and um, you know they're both they're both hideous to look at. Quasimodo is, re is 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 revulsed is repulsive by the way he looks. He has the large hump. He's disfigured. He's got the you know the the eye that's kind of modeled over, and it was deliberately uh, made to look like that in the film because that's how Hugo uh, represents him in the book. And so revulsion is a big part of horror, uh, and the same with the Phantom. Now the Phantoms don't. Uh, his the, the disfigurement of his face isn't a natural thing. He's burned by acid or fire, or depending on on what version of, of the film that you're watching, or how you uh, kind of take the the original novel. But um, he's you know he's 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 hideous as well. He's repulsive. Uh, you know, look at the unmasking scene in the in the silent film. And uh, that's you know that is used over and over again as an example of a, of a great horror moment of cinema. And so, when we're talking about the fears of mankind, I think we have to we have to include among them uh, the fear of the of the disgusting, the the ones not like us. Also, I might add that uh, the kinds of people that usually disgust us, even if we won't mention it, and if we're too polite to say anything, of course, and that's that's all very civil and uh, is a nice veneer of civilization. But even if we don't uh, acknowledge the fact that, that, that we're repelled, you know, we are, and there's that, cause, because there's that sense of the other, that sense of something else that doesn't belong, which is really at the very root of what a monster is. So, that being said, if you don't count the Phantom of the Opera or Quasimodo as monsters in the in the classic sense, and I can see where you might not, you know, from a certain point of view, but when you look at it from the point of view uh, that revulsion and uh, is a is a true part of horror, you got to be monsters. So it's time for Lex Talk Shop. This is where we talk about monster hunting as a subgenre of horror. Now, I've read about many monster hunters. I have a shrine in my room, which I'll show you one of these days, uh, to different famous monster hunters from literature and the films. Um, but I put down what I call the Monster Hunter's Code, which was a collection of bits of wisdom and, and guidelines that a monster hunter uh, might be well advised to follow. Uh, to be a successful monster hunter. So when Miles Booth put out uh, the book book two of Legends of the Monster Hunter, which is called uh, The Trigger uh, uh, Reflex, uh, I included the, or he was gracious enough to allow me to include uh, my, the Monster Hunter's code in that book. And so uh, I thought it would be a good idea to start this segment uh, of Let's Talk Shop uh, by going over one by one the, the different points or uh, guidelines of the Monster Hunter's Code. Given the choice between saving the damsel and slaying the monster, slay the monster first. If the damsel dies, it's not your fault. If the monster lives, it is. So that's just basically uh, a way of saying that Monster hunters should not really confuse themselves with knights in shining armor. Uh, 
monster hunters, the, the kind of monster hunters I'm talking about, the ones who are the John Wick minded ones, the single minded uh, monster hunters, uh, they're not heroes. I mean, they're anti heroes, probably, at best, uh, and sometimes even cross the threshold into villainy. But uh, the monster hunters that, uh, that I'm interested in are ones who kill that monster first and then you save the damsel or the, the, the victim. You know, uh, I think Sylvester says in one of the books, you know, that when you kill dragons professionally, you tend to, to save a lot of, uh, a lot of lives uh, proactively. So it's not that you're not interested in saving the life of the, of the, of the victim whoever they may be um, but that's not what comes first you kill the monster and then you can save the save the victim if you can uh, by killing the monster you pull the plug you save a lot of victims down the road that they won't have a chance to get besides you're a monster hunter not a damsel saver uh, that's a whole different uh, job description I believe now you, some people may take issue with me on this and that's fine um, but as, uh, like I said, as I'm, to my way of thinking, talking about hunting monsters, uh, I mean, the Friedrich Nietzsche quote, you know, the, the, that I keep going back to, that he who fights with monsters should make sure that uh, he does not become a monster himself, because when you fight with monsters, you take yourself down to that level. The, the, the temptation, the, the pull to get down and dirty, you know, is, is too hard to resist a lot of times. And so that doesn't leave a lot of room for uh, for a white hat. In fact, that white hat is going to get knocked off, and it's going to get downright grungy before it's over with. So first first code of the of the, or first rule uh, or guideline from the code of the monster hunter is kill the monster first. I'm still not crazy about it. Hey, thanks for joining me today on uh, Whiskey with the Werewolf Hunter. Before we go, I wanted to say that uh, after we talked a couple weeks ago about full moons and silver bullets, I had had a question come in from Amanda, who is a friend on Facebook and who I've had an opportunity to chat with a few times, and she brought up an interesting question, and she, because if werewolves are subjected or, or are affected by silver because of sympathetic magic, that is, the moon affects them, therefore silver does, silver being the moon's metal, would vampires be likewise affected by that law since, uh, or be affected by gold since gold is the metal of the sun? And I had never thought about that before. Certainly never encountered that in any of the things that I've read in the traditions of, uh, of vampires. But who knows, maybe that's something that we can explore further down the road. And speaking of silver, uh, next time we, we get together, I want to talk a little bit more about it and about the... Uh, the properties of silver when it comes to actually making it into a bullet. Now, uh, those in the know uh, have already realized that uh, silver, as a projectile, is is fairly poor. It's it's below it's below average uh, to lead and uh, and other things. Uh, so, what makes the silver bullets that Sylvester fires any different? Why why do they are so so functional uh, when um, you know? real life experience has shown people who've tried it that silver is 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 a uh, is not a good metal to do, make bullets with we're going to talk about that next time hey thanks for joining me here on whiskey with a werewolf hunter we'll see you the next time